It's that time of the year again, folks. We're counting down the best games of the year. Apologies for missing out on last year. Stuff happened outside my circle, but I was still able to play a large assortment of games. If I had to name my top two games of 2020, it would have to be Persona 5 Royal from Atlas. Jumping into this for the first time, I was introduced to this new franchise while stuck at home during a planet-wide lockdown. But what I got was a brand new adventure into a series I never thought about at all. Now, wish me luck in 3 and 4. As for my number one game of the year, there's no doubt it has to go to the Final Fantasy VII Remake from Square Enix. Already a pretty big RPG fanboy, I was amazed at the dedication that was put into what is considered by some an untouchable diamond. But I'm glad we got this game finally, and now it can be introduced to a new generation of gamers. Yes, those were pretty short reviews. If you all want to see more of my honest opinion and a more in-depth take on these games, stay tuned in the coming months for more content. With that being said, this year we had no shortage of great gaming content to explore and play. A couple of things, however. This year was tough for everyone. For example, a large shortage of consoles to go around, and it was only in the last stretch I was able to finally get my hands on one. So this year's list is sadly going to be a short one, but I hope you enjoy it. Plus, if you don't see your game on the list, please share in the comments below on the awesome stuff you played last year. With all that stuff out of the way, let's get to the list. Number 5 This is the story of a magical king. One of wizards and warriors. It's an epic game set upon the high seas. An odyssey through time and space. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, hold it right there. Oh. Look at these dolls. Almost forgot they used to be humans. It Takes Two. Starting the list off as a game I was not expecting to be so good. Especially since it was the game of the year at the Game Awards this year. Congrats, Josef, my man. You deserve it. In an age where two-player games are almost non-existent and large multiplayers are everywhere now, we have a game where it harkens back to the good old days of couch co-op and split-screen. Enter a world where every stage is a new genre. One minute you're playing the game as another platformer, next thing you know it's a one-on-one -on -one fighting game like Street Fighter. And then before you know it, it's a spaceship battle. So much content in what seems like a sweet as hell imaginative story about love, family, and relationships. It may not be my game of the year, but I can say this. Find yourself a best friend or a boyfriend slash girlfriend and get a couch and enjoy one of the best co-op experiences since Portal 2. Although, watch out for scary book demons. Ugh. What are you doing? You're not feeling it? No! Okay, you're entitled to your own opinion. Number 4 Gardeners of the Galaxy? What? No! Rocket! So, I let Groot fill out the paperwork. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. So we got fine. I might have gotten to this one a little bit late. 2020 was just around the corner. I know. But I'm glad I was able to get a taste of this flarking awesome game. After the failure that was the live service heavy Avengers game, I felt like there was little hope for another team based action game to see any success. The trailer itself looked appealing and would make your fist pump for sure, but it wasn't until you finally got a controller in your hand that you were in for a different experience. Pretty much riding on the success of the MCU. Guardians of the Galaxy has you in the familiar red jacket of Star-Lord as you travel the galaxy with your band of misfits causing either trying to make a name for yourselves or causing havoc with space cops on your tail, among other weird and interesting characters as well. What this game brings is what we always wanted in a team-based action game. In its own original story, you take control of Star-Lord, use your fellow Guardians' best traits in epic fights with either swarms of enemies or dogpile on top of a pretty OP boss. Not only is there the original story, but the interactions between the teammates is always fun to listen to. They can argue, and lines get crossed within the story. But isn't that what real family is like? Either way, if you were disappointed with how the Avengers turned out, check this one out and have real good fracking time.
number three. Are you ready? Show me your true self. Come on! Persona 5 Strikers. I am Sophia. Before a worldwide pandemic hit everybody and everything on the planet, I don't think I would have given the Persona franchise even one look. Under lockdown for almost a year, I finally ripped apart the plastic wrap and started the disc, and before I knew it, I was playing 3 and 4 back to back after Cleave 5. Then one year after Persona 5 Royal, we got the return of the Phantom Thieves in Persona 5 Strikers. Replacing the JRPG elements that have made the series what it is, instead we have a full-on button-mashing brawler as Joker and the gang explore new areas within corrupted people's hearts and look to change Japan all over again. Just picking up a couple months after the main game, Joker and the gang go on a countrywide road trip as they encounter new enemies and as well as new allies. As a first in the franchise, Atlas were able to give Omega Force the free will to explore what they could as you smash those buttons, you also still had the power of nearly every persona at your will, as you explored, leveled up, and unleashed devastating all-out attacks on your enemies. Not to mention that familiar soundtrack of previous and newer samples of songs and tunes. Like its predecessor, this was one I never saw coming for me. We are the Phantom Thieves! Number two. When you're whining, we're almost there. <laughs> Rose, where are you? Stop shouting. You'll draw the monsters. Tell me what is going on around here. It doesn't make any sense. Mother Miranda has always protected us. You escaped my little brother's idiot games, did you? Resident Evil Village. Technically number 8 in this long running franchise. Yeah, good job hiding that 8, Capcom. We have another milestone from which has been a pretty epic comeback for a franchise that, to be honest, after 4, didn't know what it wanted to be after that. Basically everything but horror. Then out of nowhere we got Resident Evil 7, which helped to harken back to a time when you tried whatever you could to survive the horrors around you. Also included were VR controls which made the events of the story even more claustrophobic. Eventually we got the next chapter in Newcomer Ethan Winter's Tale as we go from a large rural state to an even larger village in the middle of nowhere. Even though lacking the VR controls which intensified the horror elements of the last game, we still had many disgusting and terrifying obstacles to overcome. Everything from wannabe vampires, werewolves, puppets, and more. Ethan had more to survive than ever before. Taking on more of a combat heavy approach to its gameplay, you are still stuck in a struggle for your very life and either you survive to see the end, or the game breaks you in more ways than one. 8 was unlike any other Resident Evil game we could ask for, and with the promise of more to come in this new take on the series and its sequels, the new blood is looking fresher than ever. Now if only we could get some good live action movie entertainment for once. Ethan Winters, welcome. Number one Metroid Dread. And here we are folks, undoubtedly the best game I've played all year long. When I saw the trailer for this, the only thing I thought was, oh great, another Metroid. Since the last game we got was Other M, and I never had too much history with the Metroidvania type games, aside from a few exceptions. My only real history with Samus in the series was the first person Prime series, as well as everything in Smash Bros. 
So jumping into the old familiar gameplay of the series was a gamble, as I didn't know if I was going to keep playing after the first half hour. Then just like that in my first session of the game, five and a half hours just went right by and I forgot about my beat for the genre. Unlike the last game, we return to the fully side-scrolling mega exploration of past games as Samus, you run, blast, dodge, roll, explode, and more as you take down everything in your way and never forget to look badass doing it too. Even so, this was the first one to incorporate stealth elements as you also ran and tried to survive the new threats known as Emmys. Nearly unstoppable and determined to find you, these were new foes that would either break you or cause you to break your controllers. Also, never forget the fun as hell boss battles that take some real thought and strategy to defeat. As well as timing, just to see those badass finishers. Being a game that's bigger than it looks, you also find yourself determined to cover every single item and 100% the whole game as you upgrade your equipment with missiles, bombs, new suits, and more. For the longest time, it felt like Sam was just going to be known as that blaster girl from Super Smash Bros. But then thanks to some rather qualified experts that knew her history and potential, we had our favorite space bounty hunter back and now with the upcoming release of Metroid Prime 4, there's no telling where Nintendo can finally take her as much as other beloved franchises. With all that being said, that is why Metroid Dread is my 2021 Game of the Year. Now if only they could help the other Smash All-Stars. Wow, what a year, folks. Didn't see your game on the list? Then please comment below on what your favorite games were this year. Also, please stay tuned in the coming weeks as I will be putting a list of games to look forward to in 2022. See you next time, and stay awesome.